This is episode number 170 of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast, one of the shooting world's biggest gun talk programs. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, law enforcement, and the firearms industry. Before we get started, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor, Four Patriots. Let's face it, if you don't have electricity, you're living in the Stone Age. But with the Patriot Power Sidekick from Four Patriots, you get a solar generator that doesn't need installation. It's quick, easy, and portable, on the go, or even inside. The Patriot Power Sidekick is small, about the size of a lunchbox, but it's powerful. Powerful enough for your phones, medical devices, or even a mini fridge. The setup comes with a free solar panel, free shipping, a 365-day satisfaction guarantee, and best of all, you get 10% off your first purchase by typing in the code GUNMAG at checkout. That's 4 Use the code GUNMAG. Now, get ready for some tales from Larry Case, a gun writer who's also a retired conservation officer. Larry wore the green uniform in West Virginia for several decades, starting in the 1970s, and he's got a big bucket full of tales regarding poachers, bears in the basement, and a raft of other interesting adventures. Now here's Larry Case with Tales from the Game Warden. Well, Larry Case, welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast here recorded live at the 2023 SHOT Show. I am tickled to death to be here. I mean that. I didn't tickle you. Well, gee, (laughs) what a way to start, folks. Well, we do things differently here on the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm not comfortable with that. Brett, and I'm, I need a safe place. Okay, well, th- this is not it. The Guns <laughs> Magazine podcast is not a safe place. Uh, okay. So, anyway, for those who don't know Larry Case, he's a longtime gun writer, and uh, we were talking, and he is also a retired conservation officer out of the great state of West Virginia. Yes, sir, the mountain state. Exactly, and... In my career, I've known a lot of conservation officers in my state, and actually I wanted to be one at one point, and that's not the way my career worked out, but I'm always fascinated by the stories of game wardens, conservation officers, and wildlife enforcement agents. There's a lot of different names for them, but most folks call them game warden, whether that's technically accurate or not. Yes. But uh, Larry did it for a while, and the first time I've had anybody on who was a conservation officer. So wow. What years did you do it? Well, uh, I started in 1978. You got some sound effects, ooh and ah, in there. <laughs> yes, I'm old. Uh, I was I was a conservation officer, natural resource police officer. There's a mouthful <laughs> for 36 years. Don't know how I lasted that long. I turned around, and there I was. Yeah. Started in the field like everybody else. I retired as a district captain. I was a little proud of that. Had eight, nine counties, depending, you know, 25 men, give or take. And, you know, you were the boss in the district office, and you've been there. When you when you get there, you're the guy that don't know anything anymore, <laughs> and they all know everything, and they want to wear a big hat and drive fast. Yeah. But I was, I was <laughs> just, just kidding out there. Um, I was proud of what we did. Um, I was a kid laying on the floor reading Outdoor Life or Fishing Game. I wanted to be a game warden. Had no idea what they did, but I wanted to be one. And I did. And I turned around and 36 years were going. I don't know how I went so fast. Wow. Well, in our state, um, we all go to a state academy. And like I said, I've known a lot of conservation officers. I know quite a bit about our program in, mm-hmm. in my state. And i got to say, their academy, above and beyond, especially the older guys, my age and older, they really put those guys through it. I mean, getting them up in the middle of the night and they would simulate a, a, a stakeout, which is basically they put them in formation out on the running track at 2 a.m. and said, stand here and observe. Yes. <laughs> And yes, was you, your academy like that? Uh, kind of, yes. They'd kick you out of the rack at 
two in the morning and you're looking for they had a name, you know, Susie Q is lost or, you know, you've been there. Um, in, in my state, the, everybody graduates from the State Police Academy now. The basic course is the same for everyone. Uh, conservation officers, uh, now natural resource police officers. I can't get all of that out. Um, the deputies and the city policemen. When I was there, you know, right after the last ice age, we had our own class, and, uh, you know, it was a little different. And uh, th- this is how old I am, Brett. When I started, they, the DNR was still hiring guys, putting them straight in the field, generally under the tutelage of an older. But he wasn't with me every day. And when I look back on that, I could have got – in so much trouble it was kind of a badge a gun a chapter 20 law book here's some old uniforms because we don't want to give you good stuff yeah and uh by the way here's your county go enforce the law have your reports in on sunday it was almost like that yeah now of course you know when you're hired you go through the academy first but I saw it change a lot. Yeah. And and when you make it to the field, that's one of probably the defining things about being a conservation officer is most of the time you're out there by yourself. I mean, oh, backup right. will come if you ask for it, yes. but you, you're yes. pretty much on your own dealing yes. with, with all kinds of folks. Yes, that's what we, the guys are famous. And I know there are other officers that do that too, but we did it a lot. We, you know, understaffed. Two o'clock when I was in, you know, very common. You had to have a listed number. You got called in the middle of the night, or you were out there already. And, you know, three drunk guys out spotlighting deer, and the the farmers were classic for they'd see them in the field, and they'd go and pull their truck or their tractor in front of the gate and just have them there. <laughs> yeah. They were there when you got there, and they were usually not in a good mood, believe exactly. it or not. So I always said, you know, you, to handle that situation, you, you have to know what you're doing. Yeah. And if you showed one ounce of weakness, it's all, I'm not trying to appear like it was Dodge City. I'm just trying to think about it. If you showed any weakness, they were on you, you know. And officers have, I don't think a lot of people know what our officers do or the danger and it's there. Yeah. Well, I've often told people, they go, weren't you ever scared? I'm like, are you kidding me? I scared every day. I just was real good at hiding it. You know? Oh, we never showed that. Yeah. We, we 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Exactly. Uh, you alluded to this earlier. When I came in, and I was green as grass, I had no idea how much death I would see. Yeah. I just happened to be... I'm not bragging. It's not. It's just. I was just there. Yeah. Lots of shootings. Shootings. You know, hunting related. What you would call hunting accident. Yeah. You worked with the troops and the deputies, so you saw the murders and the suicides. We did all the boat patrol. All the boating accidents were ours. Drownings. You know, I don't want to be. I want to get above this. Don't be a downer. But. You know, your young guy, that policeman bravado, you're never going to show, you know, oh, that would never affect me. Right. You know what? You're human beings. And it does. You know, the first time you pull a five-year-old out of the lake, you know, the ground, it affects you. It does. So that, that was one side of the job. Do you remember your very first call on your own? After you got out of the academy, went through whatever field training you guys had to do? Well, I'm so senile, I can't remember. (laughs) Some of it, yeah, things spring back. I was young. I was quite a bit skinnier. (laughs) Weren't we all? I had a lot of hair, and I was a lot prettier than I was, than I am now, okay? And I thought... I, I mean, I could run, and I could run for a long way. Yeah. But early on, I remember, it was, when I say kids, it was young men, and it was a hunting out of season thing or something. Saw them at a little bit of a distance, 
and the race was on. <laughs> and I did not think any human being on earth, including most of the running backs in the NFL, could outrun me. That I, I just remember that being such a revelation in this kid. You know, he I mean, he flat out outran me and got away. I mean, it just killed your soul, you know. <laughs> you know, I probably found him later, but nobody can outrun me. What, yeah. what, is, what is I That popped in my mind when you brought that up. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, talk through a typical contact with a violator, you know. Um, again, that's what, you know, I always noticed the conservation officers. It was – it was an everyday thing to walk up on people with guns, yeah. you know, especially during hunting season. It, it's a hard thing to reconcile. You, you know, thank you for bringing that up because we're famous. Well, everybody you all confront has a gun. A lot of the year, that's true. Are a lot of those people as dangerous as what a lot of the city officers and everything when they encounter people with guns in the city? No. You know, most of your sportsmen, you know this. All right, they're good folks. Law abiding, blah, blah, blah. But you just never knew when it was going to be that guy, you know. And there are people, they come unhinged when they, oh, my God, it's the game warden. Yeah. That that right there, always, even today I talk to people and they'll tell you, man, when we were kids, we were scared to death of the game warden. It was like this natural, and I'd say, well, did, did you ever have a bad experience with an officer? Did No, not no. really. We were we were just afraid we were in. And yeah. just every once in a while was that guy. It was usually a, they didn't want to put their gun down yeah. thing. And those always went through a lot of those, and I'm not trying to appear, you know, the big warrior, but. They could go bad, you know, real quick. Get a lot of people out of the woods. We get, um, in my time, we really stepped it up. We had a lot of turkeys in my area. Bait, every state's different. Baiting turkeys, throwing out bait and hunting over the bait. It was real popular because it's very successful way to hunt. Yeah. It's illegal. A lot of people were doing it, and we, our officers worked on that, tramped the woods to find it, get the people out of a is a very dangerous situation there's a guy in a blind that you can't see but you know he has a gun and that can be a very dicey proposition uh, an officer not in that situation killed right after i started the first guy i worked with in the county adjoining me and that really you know it leaves a mark on you. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> well, okay, this is probably a huge topic because I, well, I know it is, but it's a question I'm sure you get a lot. I have get a lot, uh, you know, when people talk about my career. Who's nominated for the single dumbest <laughs> criminal that you've encountered, oh, whether you arrested uh, him or not? I was afraid uh, <laughs> you would ask me. <laughs> Something like that, you know. You know, I, know some, I was going. You to. know, there's some classics that I'm going to get out of here and think. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll try a couple and try to be brief. I chased. I, I've told this before, obviously. I chased a guy one time on foot, and that wasn't all the time. I don't want to make it sound sure. like every day was a foot race, but I was chasing this guy one time. It was an old. People weren't living there. It was an old house site. Everything was falling down. He went flying through there. There was an outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> you see where this is going? Oh, absolutely. Um, crumbling old house and the old privy outhouse. Now, I'm, I don't want to make it sound like it was there. People were using it every day. It was old. But, you know, animals dig under buildings. Right. You know. There was a space there, and this guy, he, he he was far enough ahead of me to be out of sight for a minute. And he, actually in one way you might say it was clever, but in essence he hid in the basement of the outhouse. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. So, so who had to take him in? Uh, I did not put him in my car, <laughs> I'll tell you that. 
I tried to put him in my sergeant's car. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work. But so he well. wasn't falling. The sarge wasn't falling for yeah. that. So I thought that was a classic. Um, you know, robo. Everybody loves robo deer stories. Right. The deer, right. You know, and people jump at. When we started, when that. I don't know what era that was. Now they have really nice. I was buying them for the guys by the time I retired. We made our own for a long time. Yeah. When we first started, you could almost put a deer hide over a sawhorse. Right. And people would stop and shoot at it. We got way beyond that. But I saw four or five guys. I remember they were from North Carolina. That's nothing against North Carolina. I want to say it was five guys, and they all had almost identical. I guess I think I got them all for credit. It was a family. Model 94 Winchesters, lever actions. And they jumped out and saw that deer, and they had a uncle or something with them. It was like the spotter and watching. <laughs> and I swear they jumped out, and the lead, we're sitting behind them yeah. you know, in the brush watching all the I wish we'd have videoed it and I mean they commenced to putting some lead down the range <laughs> ka-chang 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 I mean them yeah. weavers brass was a flying and it won't go down uh, I mean and the, and his dust and hair is flying <laughs> all this deal. they're just drilling it and uncle is standing over there I know you can't see this on the podcast but he's looking and he's incredulous. This thing is not its not running and it ain't falling. <laughs> and, he's, and that would be a clue, you would think, to most people. Didn't I, I'm not sure they didn't stop and reload, <laughs> you know, and, uh, which takes a while. Yeah. Thing. And and he's jumping up and down. You're going to let him get away. Oh, my You're God. You're going to let him get away, you know, chastising him. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe he had to be there. It was, <laughs> it was pretty good. I got a bear. I'm jumping around out of a guy's house one time. Had a bear. They got us a cub in the house. Oh, my. I didn't believe it when I got the call. I got it the first week of deer season. It's so busy. I went back a second week. It was in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, pretty much wilderness. And it, it, my, I used to tell this to my kids when they were little, and they loved it. The bear and the lady, the poor wife, is standing at the door. Why not? We don't. We don't. There's nothing here. I don't know how, and it, the bears in the basement, which was his playground, I guess, and there were some garbage cans. And if you can imagine, I'm trying to paint a picture, the bear picks up two garbage cans lids, and they're like symbols, <laughs> and that's what it sounded like. Wow. And she, it, it's so loud now, she can't hardly, well, no, we didn't, there's no bear here, you know, and I'm like, ma'am. Wonder what that noise is. <laughs> it's turned into an all day thing trying wow. to get the bear out of there. It's a hundred and twenty five pound cub. And I'm sure it was housebroken, right? Uh no. <laughs> They'd taken all the carpet out of the house because of what you just said. Yeah. And a and a hundred and twenty five pound bear can whip you <laughs> they don't know their own strength. Well yeah. You yeah. know. It, it was an interesting day. <laughs> My buddy, the deputy, showed up, who later became an officer, and he said, call each other Cod, and he said, Cod, what are we going to do with this thing? He said, you can't handcuff him. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. What, what did you do with it? I had to make friends with the lady of the house. They fed it chicken. <laughs> they got it Kroger's. I had a biologist show up with a, a big cage in the back and we had to get that bear with the lady befriended me because yeah. I was sweet to her and she got up in there behind the cage and lured him up in there wow it was a big old steel bar right cage and it had a sliding door if you will almost like a box trap or a guillotine and I knew once he got in there the second he saw I'm trapped in here. <laughs> he was going to be coming out. Yeah. And he turned around really fast. And I had to hold him. I grabbed him, you know, by the head trying to push him in, and they couldn't get the door to close. Oh, my. It was exciting for a couple seconds. <laughs> and I whipped my hand. And he just barely got me 
you know, when the I had gloves, the horny barely got me on the tips of the fingers. We have a lot of bear associated. We got a lot of black bears in West Virginia, and uh, I dealt with them a lot. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I guess this is appropriate. We had to shoot a lot of nuisance bears, and. Um, I shot a bear in a Mexican restaurant one time. <laughs> Did you really? I'm not sure that anybody else has ever done that. That's quite a hunting story. <laughs> well, I, I'm kind of proud of it. I'm still waiting for a citation or something. Yeah. Anyway, I had a lot of fun with bears. They're very interesting animals. Well, okay, so what's the most unusual? Because I know people have all kinds of crazy, crazy animals. And really, at least in our state, you're only... They only have to deal with the uh, game animals. Right. But a lot of times, you're kind of the only guy that's got any real experience dealing with an animal. So if somebody shows up with an, you're going on a call and they've got an anaconda or a honey badger or something, yeah. you tend to call the game warden. So what's the most unusual one you think you ran into? Oh, gosh. I don't, but you're right. The game warden, if there's not a, you know, these, all these little towns and counties, they don't have a. Animal control. Animal control yeah. specialist. If it's an animal and the troops and the deputies, they're your, they're your buddies. Yeah. And they're going to say, oh, let's get him up here. He can deal with this thing. <laughs> exactly. You know. A couple of really big snakes. Oh. There, there are people, you know, there's a lot. Of, there's this fringe of people that like to keep snakes. They, they just do. And a couple of really big pythons. Um, one of them I had to, once he got out in the yard, I had to shoot him with an 870. That was a couple letters to the captain. Yeah. Because of complaints, but I beat the rap. Um, <laughs> I saw a guy with a whole house full of, people get these exotic reptiles. He had several highly poisonous snakes. I mean, exotic oh stuff cobras and things like that now they didn't get out and we yeah. didn't have to handle all that mess but my goodness <laughs> you know why would somebody do that but i know they i was hoping you could tell me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i, I uh, because i've been on calls where uh, in our state timber rattlers are considered endangered yep but the snake guys they think those are really cool and i'm like that's a freaking rattlesnake. Let's call the DNR. They'll be happy to deal with it. <laughs> and he was so happy that you oh, called absolutely. him. absolutely. <laughs> he kind of did the same. It's like, what do you want me what to do? What do you want me to do? I don't know, but it's a wild animal in our state. Good luck. Call us if you need backup. Handle it, handle it, handle it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my. Raccoons. They're ubiquitous, and people like to keep them, and, and they're, they're just a fun animal. They, Got any fun raccoon they, stories? They're popular as pets. Yeah. They're, they're kind of a little bear. Yeah. You know, they're considered the little brother of the bear. But we have so many of them now. I've seen that change in my lifetime. Uh, we have lots of raccoons. And, you know, the popular, the trappers and stuff, a lot of people call them trash pandas yes. now. Because <laughs> they're, they're in the trash all the time. But really smart. Very dexterous with their hands, open doors, do do all, and they'll get, you know, in chimneys under your house, crawl down inside of a wall. You can't figure out how they got there. Yes, they can. They can be a real. They're. I mean, to caution people, everybody wants one as a pet when they're little. Yeah. They are notorious rabies carriers right the, a, a raccoon is and i by more than one vet the people bring them to the vet and want give him a shot you know like you do a dog i've been told by vets that dog vaccine does not work on a raccoon oh, really? okay so i've just always told don't don't bring that thing home and yeah. you think it's cute Dale. and they almost always get mean yes after, absolutely. after they grow up well i i can't i think the statute of limitations has been expired on this but <laughs> you can tell it yeah i had a former family member who always had raccoons mm -hmm. and yeah when they're little they're cool i remember yep. Yep. sitting on the couch watching movies at their house and 
the raccoon would run across the back of the couch and then get with those little raccoon hands in your hair. Oh yeah, and that was cool. But you're right. Once they get mature, <laughs> they are they're like a chainsaw. They'll, Especially they'll carry up. the males. Yeah. Yes, like a bear. <laughs> the the bear the boar bears if they get big enough they're almost also always the grouchy old guy. You know, they whipped all the dogs in the neighborhood. Yeah. They just go down the line and it's almost like a buffet going through everybody's garbage cans you yeah know? exactly <laughs> so anyway really interesting animals the bear but man he can be a a pest and, and like you said people like him as pets so did you have to take him in your car or anything yes uh, it was it made the game warden very popular when you go and take you know johnny's pet right uh raccoon or he had a owl or something like that and he said ma'am i'm sorry it's it's illegal it's the to, law <laughs> it's illegal to keep this thing and yeah. in the end uh, uh people really get in trouble uh pet deer right those little fawns are so cute and they raise them and it, but it's illegal to pin them up you know the officer he has to enforce the law and he's got a sergeant and a lieutenant and a captain, and those people are serious about that stuff. <laughs> and they, you know what I'm saying. And the deer grows up, and it's amazing. A, a white-tailed buck, especially, can be very dangerous. Uh, I've seen people get cut up with deer hooves. It's amazing how you know sharp those things are when they when they start kicking so talk a little bit about poaching and that's always been a pet peeve of mine you know in this day and age uh, the popular meme i guess of poachers well they're just feeding their family just yes folks are down on their luck and feeding their family and in my experience both as a responsible hunter and in law enforcement that's not the case at all not at all it's they're criminals they yeah. are stealing the wildlife resource, and it, it has very little to do with feeding their family. It, you are exactly right. And people, you know, I don't, I'm not smart enough to stay off of Facebook, <laughs> and I see the comments, and they go that way all the time. Well, I believe if a man's feeding his family, we got enough deer. Yeah, I agree. And I've seen only a couple incidents where I was there, where, yes, it was obvious yeah. when you got to the house. And ever how you talk about that, you're going to come off as the bad guy. But very rare. Very. You, you know yourself, there is so much public assistance in this country. Exactly. If you want to go feed the family, you go get the food stand. And, and that's what it's for. Yeah. But the meme, if you will, I can't think of a better... Uh, the guys just, it, it's almost never that. It is a lot to do with greed. Uh huh. Because I would sit and think about this. You sit on a trout stream in a laurel thicket and watch a guy catch 22 trout and hide them. Why is that guy doing that? Yeah. It's greed. And on the shooting side, a lot to do with big bucks. These little towns and communities, a big buck starts showing up. In Farmer Jones' um, alfalfa field, half of the guys in the county have seen him. They've all talking about him. And somebody, they cannot stand the thought of somebody else getting him. And you get into the thing of we're going to kill them and cut heads and horns off. And it's just greed. And, yes, they're stealing. You're the honest sportsman. They're stealing your deer and turkeys and whatever, and you need to report them. Some people can't stand the thought, well, I don't, I don't want to rat on somebody, you know. Well, concert, game warden can't be everywhere, and it, the the responsible sportsman is definitely his eyes and ears out there. And I t I've, tell, I've wrote a couple articles about get to know your game warden, call him up, hey, you want to come over at Hardy's, we'll have coffee, He's, he can be a dynamite source. Oh, absolutely. Uh, for you in the area, you can trade. Hey, have you seen anybody? Well, you know, down on that one place on the 
Bluestone public hunting area, not that many people hunting there. And I, I see some, I see a bunch of turkeys in there. Maybe you didn't know that. Exactly. You know, exactly. A, a good relationship with your county officer, it helps everybody. And the other thing about uh, poachers, and this, you never hear this part of it, but a lot of them are involved in things like drugs or other cr- criminal activity. Yes. Um, like you said, some of it is just flat out greed. He wants to be the guy to show off the big buck. But a lot of them are, are involved in all kinds of stuff. They're basically lawbreakers, and they, they don't stop at game laws. They just kind of do it all. And that's what really amazed me when I look back over my career, that you didn't just arrest a guy for poaching. You'd arrest him for possession of meth, possession of stolen property, all that kind of stuff. So, again, to the responsible folks out there, we think, man, I don't want to call on that guy. He's probably just feeding his family. Yeah, that could be true, but I'll bet you 90-plus percent of the time that's not the case it, at all. It 98% of the time, yeah. in my opinion, Yep, um, that is the case. And you hit it on the head. The guy that's doing all the, the real, the serial big buck killer yeah. and whatever, they're doing B&Es. Yep. There's probably drugs. Our guys, you know this, run into a lot of drugs. Absolutely. They're out in the boonies. They they just run into it, yep. you know, and you got to deal with it. And it's interesting. I've been wanting to do an article on this. The guys in my area past couple of years, last fall was really busy. They said lots of spotlight and everything. And I don't know how many times there was get them stopped, get everybody searched, inventory, heroin, fentanyl, which is really scary. And they're just running into more and more of that. And probably like your state, many states, the the officer, the DNR officer is, you know, he's a, he's a statewide police officer. Same exactly. as trooper. So whatever's out there, he just handles it. And, again, I don't think a lot of people <laughs> uh, know. Some people just don't know. I think they think the officer checks your fishing license and then he goes and, rakes leaves on the state park or something <laughs> exactly. I, you know yeah. it, it's a law enforcement uh, and and i tell this people this brett in in honesty i do not recommend it to young men and women like i used to i don't like saying that but i'm honest with them buddy as you know it's a different climate now it just is and i don't want them going into thinking I was so green and so dumb and gung-ho. Nobody could have talked me out of it. Yeah. They couldn't have. And if you're like that, then go go do it. But it's not like it used to be. It's it's truly got to be a calling. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, before we wrap up here, you've got a website. I love the name, Guns and Cornbread. <laughs> and you just gave me a T-shirt, which is going to be great to wear around. Talk about Guns and Cornbread. Well, it's everybody, they say, yeah, I don't pretend to know anything. Uh, you need a brand and everything else. I had that idea for a long time. I have a website. I'm doing a podcast, which I'm struggling with, I admit. But guns, it really does mean something. I write about guns and hunting. I'm a, I'm a gun guy. I'm not the only one. But it's guns and cornbread to me. People like to hear that, I guess. But it's where, it's me. It's where I'm from. It Appalachia, Southern Appalachia. It's our culture, and there's certainly and it means that. I know I don't explain it very well, but it means kind of where I come from, and that's how we got guns and cornbread. And what's the address? www.gunsandcornbread.com <laughs> <laughs> Please, please look us up and thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Well, Larry Case, thanks for stopping by. This is, as I said before, we recorded live at the SHOT Show. So uh, it was great running into you here and talking about game warden stories. And I'm sure, well, I know there's countless more stories. So oh, yeah. maybe we can make this kind of a regular thing. Oh, I'd, I'd love to come back. Thank you for having me so much. And I I don't know, you can't stop me quick enough. I'm looking forward to doing something with Guns Magazine. All right. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thanks, Larry. Thank you, sir.
Larry Case is full of interesting game warden stories, and maybe he'll come back someday and share a few more. If you enjoyed Larry's stories, here's a couple more episodes you might want to download. First off, try episode 100 called Gun Rider Insider Stories with the Gun Cranks, or episode 123 titled Even Gun Riders Do It, The Negligent Discharge. Finally, there's one of our listener favorites, episode number 139 called Cop Practical Jokes with Roy Huntington. If there's a topic you want to hear, somebody you want us to interview, or you want to share your thoughts, please drop me a line. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. As always, you can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, such as Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Audible, and several others. And you can always get the latest episode on YouTube and at GunsMagazine.com. At the same time, please subscribe to the Gun Cranks audio podcast on those same directories, or you can watch it at the Gun Cranks YouTube channel. I'd also ask you to visit our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and take a look at our numerous special editions available for sale on our websites and at Amazon. And finally, I'd like to remind you to visit our sponsor, 4 Patriots. You can find out more about their food kits and other preparedness supplies at 4patriots.com. That's the number 4, the word Patriots, and .com. Well, that's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>